Am I all right now? That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't believe I've, believe I've done it. I've done three present, two presentations, and this is the third one I'm doing, and I completely messed up the beginning. Um, anyway, I'll have to start again because I want the recording to be complete. Um, this project is part of Being Brent, and this is a project, um, Heritage for Health and Wellbeing, uh, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and delivered by Brent Museum and Archives. And this is the third um, talk we're doing online. And after that, we're going to have some walks on the Welsh Harp and also on Wilsdon High Road and the Queen's Park. And that will be the end of the current stage of the program. Uh, before we start, special thanks to Philip Grant, who has written the most comprehensive research on of the Welsh Harp Reservoir and the areas around it. And it is available on Wembley Matters blog and also from the Brent Museum and Archives website. And it is a brilliant um, resource for the local history. Right. Now we're looking at the actual Welsh Harp, and this is today's map, and it shows you the area of the Brent Reservoir as it is now, and it has changed a lot during the years. At the moment, it is 125 acres of open water surrounded by marshland and public open space. Um, We'll be talking about the pub that gave the name to the Brent Reservoir, but also I came across a few sources that say that it is actually looks like the Welsh Harp. And I have a picture here, and I think if you use a lot of your imagination, you can just about imagine that the shape is like the famous instrument. Um, we have underneath the reservoir the two little rivers. One going from the north here is called the Silk Stream and meeting it is Dolly's Brook. Um, Dolly's Brook has been called in quite a few maps uh, the River Brent uh, but some sources say that the River Brent actually starts where those two little rivers meet, and that's in the middle here. Um, you can't really see um, them now because it's under the main body of the water of the reservoir, but this is a very clever map which comes from the undergroundmap.com and it shows, it sort of superimposes the current map on the old one so we can just see where the cause of the little rivers and the Brent is underneath it. And the river Brent is 17, 17 uh, nearly 18 miles, nearly 30 kilometers. It rises in Barnet and travels to the Thames down at Brent, Brentford and there's some statistics there that it has 196 bridges and one aqueduct. And if we go on to the next map, yes, this is a um, map dating from 1800 and before the reservoir was built. And you can really see how the two rivers meeting here create a natural basin that the reservoir took shape on later. Um, you can also see the course of the River Brent when the reservoir is drained and there has been a few incidents, uh, there was a drought and um, a few times within its history and in 2004, sorry 2002, it wasn't here, um, the reservoir had to be drained for dam maintenance and underneath you can clearly see that's the river Brent. So it is still there filling the reservoir with water. After the reservoir the river comes out and goes underneath the Blackbird Hill and comes out in quaint and open space and you can actually see that here it looks quite nice and rural. Um, 
the river brand has taken a lot during the recent years um, in terms of people interfering with its natural course. It has been put into straight culverts with um, banks um, in concrete, which sort of messed up its natural course and the habitat around that. But recently, the organizations which manage it, like the Thames 21, um, and the Canal and River Trust, they have been trying to return the brand to its natural course. And one of such projects was at Quainton Street, just beyond uh, the Welsh Harp Reservoir. And they made it sort of nice for people to walk passed by and really looking after it. Coming to the name of the river, it's called the Brent. And uh, the most likely origin of the name comes from the Celtic goddess Brigantia, who uh, had another name, Bridget and Brigantia. They basically were the same things. And she was the Celtic goddess of the poetic arts, healing, crafts, prophecy, and divination a bringer of fertility and prosperity, and the protector of the Brigantis tribe who lived in the north of England. And she has, on this statue here that was found in Scotland, she has a spear and a helmet, and that's because she is a protector, so she's got some sort of military aspect to herself. But she was also known as the um, nymph goddess associated with water in Roman times, and there are several names named after her in England, and one of them is the Brent. The history of the, the local area can actually be dated all the way to the uh, Bronze Age, and they were the only remains they have. They actually did some excavations on the banks of the reservoir and found some pottery remains from the Deverell Rinbury period of the Bronze Age. Unfortunately, uh, those finds are not available. They couldn't be found. But what remains is the funny version of the name because Geoffrey Hewitt, who was working for the Brent Council a few years ago when the new estate was being built of Birch and Grove, um, he was asked to come up with a historic name uh, for the new area, and he wrote Rinbury. Um, people who were typing up could not read his handwriting, so they wrote Runbury, and that's why we have Runbury Circle here now. So that reminds us of the ancient Bronze Age period. Then they had the Celtic tribes with the River Brand getting its name from the Celtic origins, and when the Romans came, um, there were some Roman remains found nearby, and there's a picture here. Um, so they must have been around here as well. Coming back, back to the map, uh, here we can see that's our two rivers here, and then it becomes the Brent. And by 1745, it was fields, um, forest area, divide, fields divided into various um, farm owners. And that has been like that for hundreds of years. And nothing much really happened. And even in the beginning of the 19th century, um, you would walk past the banks of the River Brent. And all you can see around was very picturesque area and very romantic views of the River Brent. And that is an amazing picture because it's by a famous artist, J.M.W. Turner, uh, painted about 1820. And that's because he liked um, the rivers and the waters and he moved to live near the um, Thames. Uh, we don't know whether he actually went to see the Brent itself or not, but he wrote this picture here. He, he painted this picture here, which looks lovely. So that's how it was. Um, and even later on, the surrounding areas were farms. Um, in the beginning of the 19th century, modern farming methods came along, but uh, the area is heavy clay. So it's not very easy to cultivate, cultivate it for crops. So hay was the main 
um, source of the main production crop and the main source of income for the local farmers. And that was like that from Willesden all the way to Kingsbury, the whole area was mainly hay and pasture as well, milk farms and things like that. Until the canals came and the industrial revolution brought about a lot of changes. Uh, the development of industry demanded better transport and the roads were not really suitable for transporting new goods and um, also it was much easier to transport goods on the water so the canal network started being built. The main canal uh, connecting the Midlands to uh, the southern areas and to London uh, was the Grand Junction Canal uh, which came about by 1800. In 1801, the Paddington Arm uh, was, was created and they needed more water for the canals because they would need to refill them, especially when there were locks, a lot of water was lost. And also further down, the water was often used for local houses and industries. So there must be a permanent supply. Um, they built a big reservoir in Oldenham and then in Ryslip, but that still wasn't enough. So they were always looking for special, for additional sources of water. And they identified the River Brent as a very good possibility. So what they did in 1810, 1811, a feeder was, was built from a king in the River Brent at uh, Kingsbury. And the feeder went all the way down to the canal. This is the Paddington arm of the Grand Junction Canal going through Harlesden. And that's where it joins here at Lower Place. And you can see the River Brent. Um, the canal is actually carried on top of the River Brent um, on the aqueduct. And this is a lovely modern day um, map uh, taken by a drone, picture taken by a drone, and it shows, that's the dam coming out of the um, reservoir, the river Brent is here, and here we have the feeder. And the feeder basically goes straight to the canal. Even now, although most of it is underground these days, but it is still functional or no, although uh, not that much water is taken from the reservoir for the canals these days. And that's how it looks coming out of the Welsh Harp and at Quainton open space. And that's the feeder joining the canal at lower place last year. You can actually walk there and see how it's coming in. So, Another section, Regions Canal, uh, came on and they needed even more water. So they looked how they can improve on the water supply and decided to build a re reservoir at Kingsbury. Um, they started the plans at 1833, but even as they were building it, they were buying more surrounding land because uh, the canal company realized that they needed more water than they originally planned for. Uh, by 1841, the first version was nearly finished and they uh, filled it in, but in January 1841, there was a spell of cold weather, everything froze, and then there was a week when everything started thawing very, very quickly, and there was a surge of water, and the dam broke, and the water went in a huge surge all the way down to Brentford and caused havoc, and some people even died, and barges were damaged, so that was like a big incident. After that, the dam was strengthened and a um, cottage was built for the keeper who would keep an eye on the level of the water and would open the sluices and let the water out um, if it was needed. And that was sort of the first stages of the flood control. Um, you can walk around the back of Runbury Circle and see that picture now 
that's that's the view you can actually get if you walk around there. In 1853, the reservoir was enlarged and the cottage moved to where it is now, a bit further on the side. And by then it was uh, the biggest that um, we had it. Uh, since then, it has been reduced quite considerably over the years. Uh, with it, it took the pre present shape um, just before 1950s. This is what the dam looks like today. And it's still, uh, the water can still be used to supply 21 miles of the Grand Union and Regions Canal. And there's some statistics of it. The interesting thing here is in 1936, five large black iron siphons were built. I presume these are the ones. And they make it easier to control the level of the water in the reservoir. In 2002, it was drained by British waterways to repair the sluice gates. And um, now it's in good working order and they're looking after it really well. With the coming of the reservoir, not much changed around it. It was still very rural and um, used for fishing, bird watching, and local walks. Oh, that's the picture that shows the final size of the reservoir. And it covered 400 acres. It was owned and run by the Regions Canal Company. And they put up posts on the perimeter of their land. And they look like that. They've got Prince of Wales, Prince Regent's feathers around it, and they're made of metal. And I wish I could find one because this is the picture taken by Len Snow. And there is a map that shows the posts on the boundaries. But having walked around the Welsh Harp for many, many times, I have never seen one. So anyone, if anyone actually knows where I can find one, please let me know. I'd like to go and take a picture like that. And now we come to the famous coaching in bit. The picture here, uh, somewhere around about here, we'll see a better map later on, was a famous coaching in, quite an old one, called the Welsh Harp. Um, it was mentioned in the 18th century but when the Regions Canal Company was um, doing the work, um, they were worried about flooding it and the banks were to be strengthened. So they bought that one and it was later rebuilt. And also another one, another Welsh harp um, pub was built around the same time, 1853, I think a bit further up um, Hendon Broadway. Um, but then after all the work was finished, they, um, gave, uh, the lease was acquired by a guy called William Perkis Warner. And he was a local man who trained as a butcher and then he uh, worked in the uh, army during the Crimean War in the supply section. And then he came back, um, got married and decided to settle. So he bought the lease on this farm together with its fishing rights and decided to make it into something really special. And you can see where it was on this map. Um, that's the old Welsh harp here and they had a second Welsh harp. Um, by the junction with the cool oak lane. And that's the map showing the posts. That, that must be the posts going along the perimeter. Um, Warner realized that he actually had quite a good um, location for his um, new venture because it was next to the Edgware Road, which of course was the old Roman Watling Street. And it was a major thoroughfare um, going out of London from the Roman times. So it had quite, a few, quite good transport links. Um, by the middle of the 19th century, it had horse buses and in 
1869 to 70, Midland Railway built a line there. Um, they also had trams and then motor buses. So this was quite a good location to have, but it was still quite far from London. It was about six miles from central London um, to be called a countryside for people to go and visit for fun. Um, Warner convinced Midland Railway that it will be really to everyone's advantage to open a special station to get people to come to his um, hotel, uh, to his pub. And they opened the Welsh Harp Station. There it is, 1873. By then, uh, the Welsh Harp was at, at its prime and they had lots of events and activities as we're going to see in a minute. Uh, it didn't last long because it was closed in 1903 with the decline of the popularity of the Welsh Harp uh, coaching, of the Welsh Harp enterprise with the death of William Warner. So there it is. Uh, in 1859, he rebuilt it and it looked like this. And there are quite a few of historic postcards um, where you can see it looking like that. Um, this picture from Brent Museum and Archives, I put it in to show what sort of characters, I think they're very, very colorful and very much of their time, uh, would be the among the customers of the old Welsh harp. By the way, he called it the old Welsh harp because there was another Welsh harp further up at the junction with Cool Oak Lane, and that belonged to someone else, so he wanted to differentiate himself from them. Um, I don't know why they would have weighing machines, it's just a strange thing, that's what the title of the picture. Um, they uh, had a booklet published, um, which described exactly what the Welsh harp in looked like and it was not just a promotional booklet because they sold it for one penny and it had these amazing pictures that come from the Welsh Harp Reservoir Through Time book by Geoffrey Hewitt. Um, to start with you had a hall and it had um, stuffed heads of various animals at the entrance and also in the lounge, there was a little museum with specimens of birds and animals, and most of them were shot locally and displayed here, but they also had a crocodile and some other curiosities. So they had like a museum there as well. And not only the Welsh harp had stuffed animals, it also had a live menagerie. At some point, a large brown bear escaped and there was an article in the magazine appropriately entitled Fun Magazine in January 1871 under the title of Woe in Hendon, describing how the bear escaped. And finally, William Warner caught it and brought it home. I'm sure they had many more adventures with their animals. They had a saloon, a private, private bars, a billiard room, and then um, outside there were lantern lit walks, there were benches, there were cannons brought from various ex-military locations. Um, also a bit further on they had a bowling green and skittles saloon and the skittles saloon was connected to the bar in the main building by a telephone. Um, the Skittles Club was quite popular. At some point it had about 60 members and here is an advert in a local newspaper. Actually, I saw like several consecutive years they published this advert, so they promoted it quite well. It had a bandstand, obviously. Um, a regular pigeon shooting competitions at the sports field next to it. And eventually the sports field was taken over by the London Welsh Rugby Football Club in winter and the London, London Midland Railway Cricket Club in summer. And um, William Warner organised and sponsored all sorts of competitions, um, pigeon shooting competitions among them. Um, 
then later on he built a big um, Victorian music hall and a dining area and it seated 300 at dinner and 500 people for a concert and it became a popular center of entertainment and here are a few examples of the acts that you could see at the old welsh harp um any adams was a lady with a big voice big personality and big physique and she was very popular in the victorian music hall era she had a song called the jolliest girl that's out and Warner adapted, adapted it and commissioned new lyrics and called it the jolliest place that's out. It was all about how lovely and jolly it is to come to the old Welsh harp. Um, another one was this funny man called James H. Steed and he used to jump up and down about 400 times during the performance of his song, The Perfect Cure. But probably one of the most famous one was a lady called Flory Ford, and she was um, the uh, singer who uh, came up with the old down by the old bull and bush, and it's the long road to Tipperary. And one of her songs was called The Old Welsh Harp. I tried to drag the song down, and apparently it is on a CD. And um, I hope to find it one day. If I do, I will play it on my walks. Um, their entertainment was particularly spectacular during the bank holiday weekends. And the tradition carried on because in the 1950s they had a regatta and funfair and things like that. Unfortunately, after the 1950s, we haven't had anything so spectacular in the Welsh harp. Maybe someone should bring it back because it looks jolly fun. Coming back to William Warner, he organized the first bicycle race in England. And that was one day before the famous Tour de France, uh, which is considered the first bicycle, bicycle race in the world. Sorry, that was one day after the French people were first and he was the next day. But he was the first one in England and that's his velocipede, as he called it. Arthur Markham was the winner of that first bicycle race and he, was, uh, he owned a local bicycle shop on uh, Hendon Broadway. Not just the bicycle races, there was a very popular race course in the 1870s um, and it had several grounds and at some point they had steeplechase uh, races um, quite a long way off the Welsh Harp as well. It was extremely popular, although betting um, officially wasn't allowed, it was going on um, all the time and authorities clamped down on it. There was a law that forbade um, horse racing within 10 miles of London, and that was the end of the Kingsbury race course. But it was, at the time when it was on, it was extremely popular. Swimming, of course, was a popular fixture as well. Uh, they used to have swimming galas and swimming competitions. And there is this absolutely lovely quote from, uh, a newspaper called The Day's Doings. Our friends, the London Swimming Club, have held their annual fete at the old Welsh harp near Hendon and indulged the spectators who assembled there with some specimen of fancy and ornamental swimming. Um, today, no swimming is allowed at the Welsh harp, so no more fancy ornamental or other swimming, apart from occasional occasions when people swimming in the boats get overturned and have to climb back into their boat quickly. Um, in winter, of course, no swimming because quite often during Victorian times, um, 
winters were much colder and waterways including the river thames and the welsh harp here used to freeze over and it froze so solidly that they had um, winter carnivals on the ice as well as swimming as well as skating uh, William Warner organized skating in a big way. He created special areas for professionals, pleasure skaters, and a mile race. Um, and this is the winner of one of his races called George Fish Smart. So he won in 1880. And the Warner Cup is the prize that Warner himself established. So he did a lot to promote this in a big way. Um, in the beginning of the 19th century, the weather got warmer and the Welsh harp doesn't freeze anymore. The last time it was frozen was in 1963. And there's a picture which I found on Facebook showing the frozen Welsh harp in 1862. But that was that. The picture on the right here is what our winters look like today, so it never freezes. So no swimming and no skating. Fishing. Fishing was extremely popular. It was a fishing resort even before Warner bought the lease on the Welsh Harp Inn uh, because he acquired the fishing rights for the reservoir. And he made sure that it was well stocked with fish. Um, the picture here on the top shows a fishing competition that was, were popular at the time as well. Um, 1912 fishing drastically declined due to pollution, but in recent years, especially when all the conservation started to happen in the, around the reservoir, um, the quality of water has improved and now there's quite a lot of fish, of fish lives there. When they drained it, um, they had to take all the fish out really, really carefully, put it in oxygenated tanks and transport it um, to its new home in Ealing while the reservoir, while the dam was being repaired. And then they brought it carefully back and released it. And here is a picture of someone um, holding one big fish as they do it. But fishing is not allowed today either. So the fish is swimming there ever so happily. Balloon racing, of course they must have balloon races, and this was um, a very popular site for balloon races in the 1880s and 90s. And there was a very interesting incident, it's like a big article in a local newspaper about uh, Miss Emmy Devoy, her name was. Um, she went up into on, on a balloon and um, her particular thing was to come back, come down on a parachute to entertain the spectators but her parachute was blown of course uh, and she ended up in the water near cool oak lane bridge um and then someone jumped in to help her but she was rescued by a boat before he could reach her and that made the local news um i couldn't find a picture of a balloon race on the welsh harp or miss devoy so I thought I would include this mosaic here and I will show more mosaics picture, pictures later on. And they come from the Meesden underpath that recently acquired um, a huge set of mosaics which are very colorful and represent just about every aspect of um, the history of the Welsh harp and the surrounding area. And this picture here I think this must be Cool Oak Lane Bridge. And, um, and this was an ancient road, an old road that used to go from around Kingsbury towards to join um, Edgware Road. And when the reservoir was enlarged, they built a special causeway to carry the road and the bridge and it was very spectacular round about the turn of the century and that's what it looks like now um, we had great trouble trying to take this picture because it's all overgrown um, you can't see it from the bank now it's all vegetation there and it looks lovely and spectacular um, 
Oh, something went wrong with my slides. Okay. Um, the Welsh harp, that's the building as it would have been uh, from the, the opposite bank. You can see it really well here. It existed. Um, it, um, William Warner died at the Old Welsh Harp in 1889. His wife and his family carried on the business uh, for the next few years until the lease expired. And they tried to put in events, but without his entrepreneurial skills and inventiveness, um, it was not so easy. There was also lots of rival entertainment happening around Wembley and gradually um, the Welsh Harp sort of declined in its fortune as a major entertainment center for Londoners to go and enjoy or for a break in the countryside. In the 1930s, the old Welsh Harp was completely rebuilt and replaced by a new building. The only thing they kept was the old music hall that stayed for a bit longer. And it stood on Edgware Road which is the road here, until 1971, when it was demolished to make way for A5, when they were building the Staples, flyover over the Staples Corner. And that's the site where roughly it was now, that's sort of the slip road over there. There was another Welsh harp uh, from about 1853 at the corner with Cool Oak Lane. And that building, later on the restaurant survived till 2008 and that was demolished as recently as 2017 and now there are uh, there's a big block of flats there on that corner um at the first uh, the first years of the 20th century it was still very rural and it all started, uh, oh, that was the Cool Oak Lane. And I think I tried to take the picture from a similar angle here, which shows the modern bridge today. It's all changed with the coming of the First World War. Um, around that time, there were quite a few manufacturers of aircraft in the area and uh, Welsh Harp was ideal to test water planes. Uh, one of the most curious ones was built by a company called Headley Page. Uh, they developed a seaplane and they tested it on the Welsh Harp, but it was never built because they hoped to get an order and they didn't. But it was used for several others for seaplanes. And also they tested tanks. Um, they had a mechanical warfare supply department um, at Dolly's Hill, and they um, developed the first tanks during the First World War. And here I'm going to play this little film. And I'm actually, is it? That's not playing, it is playing. I'm going to fast forward it quickly to where it actually shows the tank going in the water. So it will in a minute, which I think is quite spectacular. Uh, they built three of those. They called the land version, uh, the pig, and the water version, the duck. And they only built three. It was towards the end of the First World War, so uh, they weren't used en masse, but they were fully functioning. Uh, one of them survives in the museum, but you can actually see it swimming, which I think is absolutely amazing. And they were basically armored personnel carriers. They could carry 50 armed men, but they only had one machine gun, so it was only mainly for transportation. So there it is, swimming in the Welsh Harp. There it goes. It was called Ta Tank Mark 9. Um, 
so after the war, the next development was the construction of the North Circular Road. And um, to do that, uh, the uh, section of the Welsh Harp had to be filled because um, North Circular went right where the water was. And there was the aqueduct that carried the Midland Railway. Um, and that can be seen today uh, because that's the same arches. That's the junction. And as you approach it, you can see that's the old arches of the Midland Railway aqueduct. And that's how the North Circular Road looks now from the air. Um, our section here was built in the 1920s. Um, and the reason the North Circular came into being is because um, there was a lot of industries growing around the perimeter of London. And it was thought that it would be great to um, make a good transport supply to, to the area. And also the Empire Exhibition at Wembley, uh, 1924, um, also good transport links were needed for that. So that's the big Welsh harp expanse next to the North Circular. At the junction, which is now called Staples Corner, we had a mattress building factory. That's the one on the bottom left hand side. And it was called, the name of the company was Staples and there were manufacturers of bedding um, located here. Um, and um, the junction came to be known Staples Corner. Housing was being built at Dollis Hill and along the North Circular Road. So the area became quite urbanized very quickly. And that's North Circular Road Junction before uh, the Nisden underpass was built in 1973. Still very busy. Um, with the development, with the housing developments in the area, uh, amenities came as well. And one of them was the uh, library, Nisden Library, that was on the corner here. And that's this building here. Uh, that's the picture of it when it's open. And it is now um, Tree Pajapati Association London branch. So that's a Hindu center here now, but the building is still there. Um, also, uh, Wickham Primary School was opened in the beginning of 1930s as well, just uh, next to it here. So the area was becoming quite urban. Um, one fun thing they did in the 1930s is the gatherings of naturalists, the nudists. And in, the ni in 1930, there was a a huge outroar, it was even called the sunbathing riot, when 250 sunbathers were attacked by 200 objectors, and it made um, all the press, of course, lots of jokes on the subject. But after that big riot, uh, they sort of stopped coming to the Welsh Harp. Um, it was not all sort of peaceful on the water because they had noisy sports there as well. Motorboat racing was very popular in the 1930s. Um, and here we have a lovely picture of Anna Neagle and Amy jo Johnson. And Amy Johnson, of course, is famous for, the, um, soul, for her solo flight to Australia. And she was a very famous aviator in the time. Uh, she lived locally in Kingsbury. Um, and they are here on a motorboat. And here we have a little film. We probably won't have the time to watch all of it, but we can actually see the motorboats. It's called Skillful Archery, and it shows uh, the men shooting arrows at a target from speedboats. I want to fast forward it a little bit, if I can. can I? In a moment, we are going to see the arches of the Midland Railway aqueduct, and you will see how close the water came to what now is the North Circular Road. I think I'll just 
let it play until it comes to that day. And then shortly after that, in the 1940s, the area was filled in. Yeah, there they come at the background. And next to it will be the building of the old Welsh Hall. Yeah, that's the old Welsh Hall. But I think we'll go on to the next one, uh, which is the Dollis Hill Research Station, um, built on the opposite side, which is now a housing estate. And that, of course, was famous for developing the first computers, which were used at Bletchley Park for decoding the German machines. And that played a very important role during the First World War, so, sorry, during the Second World War, when they had a bunker constructed in the basement of the Dollis Hill Research Station, which was supposed to be um, the place for Churchill and his cabinet in case um, central London was bombed. And there was a rumor that a seaplane uh, was provided nearby on the Welsh Harp, just in case they had to be evacuated quickly, but no one seems to have confirmed that rumor. There was, however, a lot of bombing uh, going on during the Blitz, and you can see the dotted lines. And I think that map is not particularly accurate because I used it for Queen's Park and more bombs were known to have fallen than are shown on the map. And one of them left us a reminder of what happened during the Second World War, because this is a bomb crater on the side of the reservoir, uh, which was left as a crater and became a pond, which is now a home for amphibians, wildlife and frogs, newts, and things like that. And from time to time, the volunteers clear um, the vegetation here so that the creatures can actually live and breathe there. Um, 1941, Sea Cadets uh, was formed to train on the Welsh Harp, and they're still there with the headquarters of Cool Oak Lane. And they have a training base in the sailing base on the Welsh Harp. Um, a lot of local companies, well, not a lot, a few of the local companies set, um, changed to their production during the Second World War uh, to accommodate the war needs and the Hickman's uh, factory that used to make uh, shop fittings um, they started making landing craft, which was a boat used to transport people from ships um, 10 miles offshore uh, onto the beaches, and they were used on the D-Day in Normandy. Um, after the war, quite a few local companies, especially bigger ones, formed sailing clubs for their employees. And here is Hedley Page, that's the one who created the seaplane and they were aircraft manufacturers. That's apparently Mr. Hedley Page himself. Um, they had their own sailing club and Smith's Industries did as well, which later became the Seahorse Club. Um, not, they couldn't always swim on the Welsh Harp because in 1936 they had a drought and people could just walk. And again, you can see the River Brent or what remained of it at the time. Apparently the same thing happened in 1976 as well. Um, but when it was filled with water, it was an excellent place for water sports and sailing races and boats for hire at Warner's Welsh Harp were known as early as 1880s. And sailing was the most popular activity on the Welsh Harp ever since. Uh, the first club was formed in 1930, the Brent Sailing Club at the Old Welsh Harp. Um, in, the, in, 19, in the 1960s, a youth sailing base was open, opened um, on the Barnet side of the Welsh Harp, and that was extremely popular. It had hundreds and thousands of people coming to it every year with all types of sports activities. 
but in 2004 it was closed by Barnet Council and later on um, there was a little park on that area and later on it was developed by Barrett Holmes and that's the site of the youth sailing base now. However, the sailing continued and um, in, um, they had a sailing place where the canoe uh, club is now and then in 2004 a Phoenix Canoe Club was formed, which is in that space there now. But canoeing was one of those first water sports popular, pop popularized on the Welsh harp as early as um, 1866, when John Rob Roy MacGregor, the, father, the grandfather of English canoeing, tested a first canoe here. And then he formed a club that existed until 1900s. So, the canoeing had a long history here as well. And uh, this place here um, specializes in canoeing mostly, although they do offer other activities as well. And recently uh, they uh, got funding and developed a planning permission for a new building. And on their website, it describes how big and beautiful and huge it will be. And it will offer all sorts of other activities as well. So we are watching when the work actually starts. That will be interesting. And that's the sailing base now. And here is a list of organizations that uh, form it, the Welsh Hub Sailing Association, and the association, the association leases uh, the land and the facilities uh, from what must be the Canal and Rivers Trust, and they established their base here, and it offers activities for grown-ups and children, it's extremely popular, and they have open days from time to time, so you can actually go and see what they're doing. And that's some of the things they have boats, uh, canoes, um, and all sorts of water sports and engine well. The only thing they don't have now is motorized boats as such. They have motor boats which they use for rescuing, like if they have a race and someone turns over, they would send a motor boat to rescue you. But apart from that, um, those early motor boats of the 1930s, uh, the boats became much more powerful and they needed a deeper. Um, deeper water and bigger space, so they kind of stopped coming here. And that's the Nisden underpass um, subway, and that carries, uh, that's for pedestrians to go underneath uh, the North Circular Road from Blackbird Hill to the Nisden area itself. And they show all sorts of things imaginable, and the balloons were there as well. So that's a lovely, joyous place to see. Uh, we're trying to find out who made them and when uh, they were installed. So if you have any more information, please let us know. Um, not, they or didn't only had amateur and fun activities, they had some professional competitions as well. Um, that's the Rowing Championships 1960. And they also had competitions in 1966 and 1969. And during the 1969 ones, I think this one here, they had a fun fair. Um, so that must have been popular as well. And it's probably around the time when that first picture was done when, um, with the fun fair and the Welsh Hub. I think this is the Nisden Rex side because this looks like it's opposite corner. Um, going away from the water, another very interesting development is the plan to create a Wilsdon Cemetery in the area. And in 1928, Wilsdon Urban District Council bought 40 acres of land on the north side. And they had a plan to lay out a lawn cemetery and a garden of rest. And that was because the Wilsdon Cemetery, which was opened at the end of the 19th century, um, 
um, near Roundwood Park was filling in fast. The population was growing and they realized that something more area will be needed. But there were problems because they had to negotiate with Kingsbury um, permissions and things like that. And it just didn't happen. And there were all sorts of problems and complications. Um, in the nine, the only thing that um, they managed to agree at some point is that part of it, where allotments are now, or would be used for mass burials if um, it needed, um, they needed a mass burial site um, during a war or in terms of emergency, but luckily this never happened. In 1950, Wilson applied again to use that land as a burial ground and they negotiated a smaller space and some of the space was um, allotted for recreational purposes. That's the area where the north side of um, uh, the Welsh Harp open space is. Um, and then they actually did plan and build a cemetery. In 1954, Kingsbury Lawn Cemetery was consecrated and they built a superintendent's house and a chapel. Uh, that's the um, area. Um, they made um, surveyor's plans, which are available from the Brent archives. And they have lots of pictures over there showing the area being used as sports field at the time. And also this area here, uh, which I believe is uh, like the car park would be to somewhere here probably. And it shows very little vegetation. So I was wondering if it actually, um, what is growing there now, trees and things, are quite recent from after 1950s. And that's the chapel that was built in 1956. Um, and if you go to the Greenhouse Garden Centre, the Burton Grove Garden Centre, you would probably wonder what this building is, because it does actually look at a church, because, and that's because it was built as a chapel. Um, for a while, it was used by Welsh Harp Environmental Education Centre and then by a company called Energy Solutions, but that's now closed. Uh, the company is not trading and the building seems to be not in use. I don't know what's happening there now. Um, and this is the superintendent's house right by the entrance to the gate. Um, and... Um, Someone lives there, it's a private residence at the moment. The allotments on the opposite side, uh, that's where they were planned to have mass burials, but thankfully that never happened. So despite them laying that out, the idea came to nothing. What we have there now is the Welsh Harp Environmental Education Centre, uh, which offers facilities for school groups. They used to have activities for uh, uh, during the weekends and holidays, but they don't seem now, it seems mostly for school groups. And further up, we have the garden centre, which started its life as a nursery to grow plants for Brent's park service. Um, and they built these rows of uh, glass houses to grow uh, flowers for the borough of Brent. In 1999, it became an independent greenhouse garden centre, and now it's called Birch and Grove Garden Centre here. And now, of course, the area is a lovely place for a walk, but it's also a very important in terms of nature conservation. And bird watching and the area for birds actually was very important and its importance was recognized even in the Victorian times. One of the first bird watchers was a guy called James Edmund Harting and he wrote a book called The Birds of Middlesex in 1866. And this is a very curious book because it doesn't have any pictures. The only picture that it has is this one here, it's front plate. And then there are no pictures in the book, but a very detailed description of the birds and the music of how they sing. And I think that's most curious. They don't do it these days for the books on birds. Um, 
But the way they went around it, they would shoot the birds, stuff them and study them that way. So their policy was shoot first and ask questions later. Of course, they don't do it now. Now they just study and um, write books about it. They, um, and there is this lovely book which came out in 2001. Um, and it's the birds of Brent Reservoir. It is very scientific. It gives their scientific names and things like that. Um, 253 species recorded in 2016. Every time I go there for a walk, I see one or two. So I'm absolutely amazed at people who can actually track that number of birds, but a lot of them are very rare. Also 28 species of butterfly, bats, amphibians, and all sorts of lovely creatures and plants over there. Um, in 1972, Welsh Harp Conservation Group was formed as a response to some proposed development around the um, banks of the reservoir. And they have been carrying on very important work ever since, um, looking after the reservoir, recording the birds and recording the wildlife. And if I can go back, sorry, I've got a cat. Um, if I can go back to this picture here, can you see the old Wembley Stadium uh, with its famous white towers? And here we now have the new one, so it's a very good view of the new Wembley Stadium. Um, so the importance of the Welsh Harp as a nature reserve was recognized quite early on. As early as 1948, it came into public ownership and was managed by the British Waterways Board. And in 1950, it became a site of special scientific interest. Um, in the 1980s, wetlands habitat was created. And what they did, they completely redid the uh, banks on the uh, southern side where uh, Dollis uh, Brook joins uh, the River Bren, uh, joins the reservoir, I think it's somewhere around here, and they cleaned up a lot of the silt using special machines, built new reed beds, and constructed nesting rafts and little islands for the birds to nest on, and I believe that must be a reed bed. Um, so they created natural habitats on the other side. Um, in 2005, the status of a local nature reserve was awarded. And here is a map which shows uh, what it is and who owns what. And it's quite complicated, but it is very interesting because it shows how all these things overlap and what actually bring, happens in terms of management and conservation. Um, Things like sites of special scientific interest and um, important habitats and things like that, local nature reserve, of course, it's very important, but also metropolitan open land, it's a very important status as well, which means that it cannot be built over and will be preserved for the local community and local um, nature for as long as possible, really. Um, there are several voluntary groups that help look after the area. Uh, the Welsh Harp Conservation Group, um, Friends of the Welsh Harp and Cool Oak Lane Group, which was formed recently during the lockdown, and they do regular activities cleaning up rubbish. So if you look on their website, I think once a month they get together and the Welsh Harp Conservation Group, they organize nature walks and the other two organize cleanup operations so that the uh, place looks lovely. And this is just a short list of books and sources. Um, do look up Wembley Matters blog and the Welsh Harp Reservoir story. Um, it has loads of amazing pictures and everything you would ever want to know on that. And um, the book uh, by Jeffrey Hewitt, The Welsh Harp Reservoir, is available from Brand Archives. So if you can't find it in the shops, it is actually 
um, in the brand archives. Um, we are the Wilson Local History Society. Uh, we organize regular events and walks. Um, after, especially after the lockdown, we started doing more local history walks because people seem to be very keen on those. And we're going to have um, a walk around Roundwood Park in summer. And we also publish a journal with articles on Wilson local history twice a year. So please look up our website and um, do join us. The project Brand Heritage Walks and Trails is not just the walks. We have created um, self-guided history trails for children originally, as we thought. But then we had huge feedback saying how much adults enjoyed doing them too. So we call it suitable for all ages because adults enjoy it as well as children. They should be available in all local libraries. We uh, gave them a good supply. If not, they can be downloaded and printed from uh, the Brand Heritage website. And the um, Welsh Harp Trail will go to print, hopefully next week, should be available shortly, probably even for the first walk um, on the Welsh Harp, which I'm going to do on the 5th of uh, February. And that's more about our project. The project is sponsored by National Heritage Lottery Fund. And the way they assess the success of the project is um, how much feedback they, they receive. So if you could please fill the feedback form, um, Eventbrite will send an automatic email with the link to the feedback form and you can find it on the website. And hopefully, um, if they like our project, uh, we will be able to carry on and bring more local history research, local walks and trails all around Brent. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing the screen and I will stop the recording.